Hi, this is Jeff. Stay tuned for my latest interview. I wanted to tell you about a show that I think you'll enjoy. Play on podcast, epic audio adventures that reimagine Shakespeare's timeless tales, featuring original music composition and the voices of award-winning actors. Each episode explores plays from Macbeth to A Midsummer Night's Dream in a way that you can actually understand, created specifically for the podcast form by some of America's most exciting playwrights, directors, and composers, and performed by stage and screen's best. Look out for their new series, The Tempest, and hear Shakespeare like you've never heard before. Listen to Play On Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm joined on the podcast today by Patterson Joseph, successful and award-winning actor and now author of the new novel, The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho. Stephen Fry, actor, comedian, and writer, wrote about the novel, an absolutely thrilling, throat-catching wonder of a historical novel. Patterson, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Stephen Fry. <laughs> Great. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your new novel, The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho, how would you describe the novel? I would describe it as an interior monologue from someone who lived in the midst of the 18th century um, and a black man at that. So you're getting an angle that you never usually get um, of the slave trade. Obviously, that's going to be l looming large since he was born on a slave ship. And of 18th century London, but an 18th century London that we haven't seen depicted either in novels or on the screen. Do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho? Yeah, it was a moment I was having a, a sort of chat with, uh, I know it sounds like I'm name dropping here, uh, Tilda Swinton. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> and we were doing a movie and uh, had a lot of time in our hands. And she asked me, what would you, it is, what, it's so esoteric her questions, but this one was, what would you like to be remembered for when you die? We were playing cards at the time. I remember being arrested and going, uh -huh. should I play the ace of cards to uh, answer this question? And I just opened my mouth and said this. I said, I would love to create something that was for the younger generation of black British children so that they can understand the long history that we have in the United Kingdom, uh, whether it's play, a book, a film. And on we went and we played cards. I think I lost that round. I was quite distracted. Because <laughs> it, it was 1998, 99, and it just stuck in me. And I went home and began to sort of study and read on um, black presence in Britain. Now, we, I know because of my parents' um, uh, origins in St. Lucia, which was a British colony when they came um, in the post-war generation, the Windrush generation, as they call it, based on the fact that there was a famous ship, not the first ship, but the famous ship that came from the Caribbean and brought Caribbean um, Ex, people from colonies and ex-colonies to come and help in the post-war effort. So they're called the Windrush Generation, and I knew their story, and I'd written a bit about their story, but I didn't know about a story anterior to that, or even if there was a story anterior to that on British soil. And so I picked up a book by the wonderful Gretchen Gertziner called Black England, just been uh, reissued and, and updated. Uh, mm -hmm. Zadie Frost's favorite book, too. We come from a similar neighborhood and similar backgrounds. and we, we both found this book in around 99. And this book t depicted a, an England that I had never heard about, a Britain that I had never heard about, from Roman Britain, 3rd century AD, Septimius Severus, a man who came from Libya. He was the emperor of Rome and came to govern England and rebuild Hadrian's Wall. I'd never heard any of these stories. Um, John Blank, who was a famous trumpeter, along with many others in the courts of Henry VIII. Um, and uh, here was this portrait. I turned over a page and there was this portrait of a black man 
painted in 1768, um, looking like a lord. If you ever see that uh, portrait, he's he's looking off screen, as it were. He's painted in a glowing light. He has a bright red waistcoat, deeply, deeply white cravat, hair perfectly coiffured, and his hand is in his waistcoat like a man of leisure. Uh, and it, it, it's such a strange, incongruous is the word that came to mind, image of an 18th century black person that I was arrested by it immediately. And then when I discovered that some fragments of his story, that was the end of it. I absolutely had to write a story about him because he lent himself to a sort of theatrical, if you like, or dramatic um, uh, depiction. Well, as I mentioned, I mean, you're a successful and award-winning actor, as you just mentioned, um, working with Tilda Swinton. And you've starred in the Mosquito Coast and Apple TV Plus original series, Doctor Who, and many, many others. Have you always written fiction or been a writer as well as your work on screen? Uh, I was one of these kids who didn't do very well at school. So I, I always presumed that my um, the sort of academic intellectual side was quite um, dull. Uh, and so I, I never had confidence. Even in the things I did write, I was still compelled to write. I've been writing since I was about 16, if not longer. But everything's in the bottom drawer, like a lot of people. And I thought my skill, my only skill really, lay in depicting other people, immersing myself in other characters and becoming them. Uh, and I was pretty good at it. Obviously, I've made a career and a living out of it. But writing has always been, to me, something that I could only do for myself. I didn't really know whether other people were interested in what I had to say, what I had to write. And it was the compulsion, I suppose, to tell various stories that made me uh, get a bit braver. First thing I wrote in 99 was about my parents' generation. Um, and I, I remember showing it to Danny Boyle, who directed the film till and I had uh, been doing The Beach, and him saying, yeah, you're a writer, you can write. Uh, and even though that didn't come to anything, it gave me the impetus to think I can do more. And so I began to take myself, it took me a while actually, it probably took me a good five years after that to really think of myself as someone who's capable of writing something for public consumption. Um, you know, we all have a bit of, I suppose, imposter syndrome, uh, low self-esteem in certain areas, and that was <laughs> mine. Um, but, but thankfully, the compulsion to write Charles Ignatius Sancho's story was strong enough for me to say, I don't think anybody else can write this. I have to do this myself because uh, only I have what I have in my head. I can't convey that to anybody. Um, and uh, yeah, so so yeah, I consider myself a writer now, but it, it took a, it took a while. I'm coming at this as someone who is an American and, and lives in America with obviously our history with race. But you had mentioned earlier about you know um, uh, I think you said the name of the book was Black England. What is the um, what is kind of the general awareness among um, British citizens who are black about kind of the history of um, and the diaspora in 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 England of uh, the black citizens? Yeah, that's such an interesting question, Jeff. Uh, so I grew up uh, not knowing anything about black British history on British soil. Um, I knew about uh, colonialism. Um, just, they taught a little bit of what they call the triangular slave trade at school, but they really only brushed past it. And we, we I don't think any of us in that, that class um, in, this, in the mid-70s really understood it. And then Roots came out in around 77. Mm -hmm. Even though we're British, we related to that story in ways that were enlightening for us, because I don't know that we made a big connection between ourselves and Africa. Some of us did. Some of us were just ignorant. We're growing up in the system. So the system, if it's not teaching you, uh, unless you seek it or your parents seek it or some other adult seeks to educate you about it, you're not going to know about it. Um, uh, and, and any hidden history is well hidden if it's hidden from the general curriculum. So I, I, I um, grew up not knowing, and most of the people that I encounter, uh, black people in Britain, uh, not Lead, you know, much less white people I encounter in Britain are pretty ignorant of any history before 1948. And I said this famous ship, the Empire Windrush, docking at Tilbury and bringing Caribbean migrants. Most people 
that I encounter most. And I'm talking about scholars now, and I'm not talking about uh, your average Joe who doesn't, you know, interest themselves too much in history or, or intellectual pursuits in that way. Um, they don't know this story either. And and what's even more curious, Jeff? And I suppose I'm here in New York um, because the book is launched today, coincidentally, um, on the 11th of April, uh, as we speak. Uh, but we toured the one person show, which is the first manifestation of my telling of the story of Charles Ignatius Sancho. And we started here because Britain in 2016, when we wanted to tour the play, was a <laughs> it was a post racist world. <laughs> and um, and people weren't interested in the story necessarily or, th or felt that it had any re relevance. It seemed like an old story. And I took that as, as read as well. I thought, well, maybe I'm behind the curve and we've moved on and I'm telling stories that don't seem to matter to people, ironically. Um, but the first place I, I, the first big gig that I got, apart from the um, Oxford Playhouse who co-produced it with me back in England, was at the Kennedy Center in Washington. Which is quite a big leap from we're not really interested in the story to hey the Kennedy Center will have you for a week, um, and I was pretty bowled over by the the aspect of the, the the prospect of it. And here's the aspect of the whole trip that changed my mind about Sancho, about this telling of the story, and and enlightened me a bit about America too, and their knowledge of Black British history. Is as I performed at the Lincoln Center to about 400 odd people, at the end I'd had a Q&A and I asked people if they knew any of this kind of history. And about four people in this entire auditorium put their hands up and they were all adults. Um, and then these four, I mean, I would get questions like, and I got this all the way through the tour when I toured in Pittsburgh and in, um, in, in, in Philadelphia, when I, when I went to the National Black Theater in Harlem, when I went to Brooklyn Academy of Music, everywhere I went, Texas, people would ask this same question in the Q&As, and it was shocking to me, but I, I, I really got used to the question in, way, in many ways. Are there other black people in England? And did Britain ever have slavery? So, so these shocking questions made me sort of reassess what this story was about. The, the big thing in the Washington um, presentation that, that I, I was struck by and remember to this day Four African American women, I would say they were must have been in their 70s, late 70s, actually, early 80s, getting up and saying to me, Son, this story about trying to find your papers to vote, which is what happens at the end of the play, uh, this is not an old story, son. This is happening to us today. And, and it, sh it struck me then that Sanchez's resonance was transatlantic and, and sort of transtemporal, I suppose you could say. Uh, and that he had something for us all to think about today. What was your writing process when you were working on the novel? Were you were you writing on the set while waiting to film a scene, or did you <laughs> fit your writing in between acting jobs? How did that work for you? Well, if we're talking about the novel uh, specifically, everything else is done on the hoof. My day job um, was going very nicely, thank you, but... Um, whenever I had a break, I would write. <laughs> but I got lucky in a way, in a, in a very unlucky time, as it were. So the beginning of 2020, uh, 2020 uh, I had begun a television series called Vigil, which was set on a submarine. Um, and we had done maybe six weeks of it, first episode and a half of six. And then lockdown happened, the first lockdown. And uh, I had about four months and after about a month of doing some volunteer work and some other stuff, I thought, if I don't write this novel that I've had in my back of my head for nearly 15 years now, I may never get the chance to do it. And so I sat down in that lockdown and I wrote it. I, I basically spent most of the days in my pajamas um, and not knowing <laughs> what, what time of day it was. I don't know if other writers have ever experienced that. It sort of go through a kind of – it wasn't the dark night of the soul, but it was certainly um, – a, 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 a very very long day <laughs> of the soul <laughs> where i was um i was only writing that um, and so the first proper full draft of it was completed by about um august of that year from so so i was writing from about uh, i would say end of may early june through to through to august um, every single day for every hour uh, i could 
So I got lucky, really. It's hard to, to write novels. This is the thing you write about writing, Jeff. The, 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 the statistics for who gets to write and who writes anything that gets seen, published, largely they're middle class people. And largely sure. they are an, an upper, people with time on their hands. And that's a very narrow demographic for the ideas in print, I would say. And, and probably the same, I would imagine, I don't know the statistics as well, in, in, in terms of movies and, and television shows, is that they're written by certain people because those people have the massive commodity of time. And money gives you that. Um, status sometimes give you, gives you that, and class can certainly give you that. But um, it's, it's a bit poor, and it's a shame that, um, that we are. I mean, I would definitely class myself, certainly, in, in that bracket now because I, I had time on my hands. Most of the people that I knew who were key workers certainly didn't have time on their hands even during lockdown. In fact, their time was even more squeezed. So, sure, I, yeah, sure. I got lucky in an That's unlucky time, point. I'd say. Yeah. Do you think you'll write another novel? Hard to say. Um, I, I'm a bit of a, um, I suppose, a gadfly in that, in that I, I've directed once. Uh, I've, uh, I've written a, a, a monodrama once. I've written a, a nonfiction book once, and here's my novel. Uh, is it going to be once? I don't know. I certainly enjoyed the process. It, it is, to me, the purest form of storytelling. There's nobody in the way. As if you can decipher the words on the page, then they become images in your head forever, unmitigated by anybody's design or casting <laughs> or acting choices. And, um, and it's pure. The next best step, I, I think, the next best one is the, the audio book where you get to paint pictures in your head of what's coming at you. But even that is a step away from the purity of the, the written word. So um, I, I feel that if I'm going to tell stories again, it'd be very hard for me not to want to tell that story. And, and you can't be any more intimate, I don't think. You can't really be any more intimate than than my your eyes to your brain. You know that that's a very intimate way of telling stories and a very intimate way of seeing a character um, from the inside. Well, well, given your your work in film and TV. Did you find any kind of similarities when you were working on the novel? Did you find yourself uh, thinking about acting out a scene or, or anything like that? How, how did that work for you? Well, my thing is always about the sort of aural power of words, the, the, the oral histories that come down through my people. Um, I've discovered only quite late recently of my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was a storyteller and I had no idea. I'd never met him. Um, but I think we're, we're long talkers in <laughs> my family. We're long talkers. I, I can't tell you how I got here today at uh, my publishers here at Macmillan, Henry Holt, uh, without telling you the whole saga of being trapped in the lift lobby. Um, <laughs> it's impossible. So, so that long form storytelling was right up my alley. But I would say the big thing that connected with my acting life and career and skill, I suppose, training was this, was that when you've got a character that you're trying to portray on stage, what you look for is what we call subtext. And by that, I mean, what is your backstory as you come on stage? You don't simply read the lines. David Mamet would, I think, quite cheekily argue that that's all the actor needs to do. Uh, I think what you want to bring, certainly what I want to bring, is uh, the weight of history so that when somebody comes on stage, they're coming with something. They've been somewhere thinking something and they come on stage and even though they won't tell you what that thing is, it has to inform the way they speak. So what we would do as actors, which was only at drama school, we haven't done this for some time, but I do it almost sort of casually now with every character, is a thing called hot seating. And what that basically means is you sort of interrogate your character. So you might ask the question, so what's your problem? And the person would say, well, my father has died very recently. My mother's just married my uncle, his brother. I have a problem with that because it's so soon. And also my dad, I think he died under suspicious circumstances. And I don't like the way they're carrying on as if they're young lovers. It's ridiculous. 
And do you think, well, okay, I'm going to go on stage and, and go, well, this too, too solid flesh, which it would melt and thaw and resolve itself into a dew. And you're speaking the lines of, you know, Hamlet to be or not to be. That is the question. Should I live? Should I die? Should I kill myself? I don't know. But underlying that is the work you've done in the backstory, if you like, the subtext of the man, uh, which informs how you deliver these lines. And I think with Sancho, it was precisely that. If you read it, it's written as a, a first-person narrative. I imagine a collation of diaries from the age of 17 to 50-odd, when he, 51 when he died, collated for his son, who's just been born. And it, Sancho knows he's only got a few years to live. Um, so he wants his son to know who he is, like a lot of parents want us to know who they are, I suppose. Um, certainly my father would always sort of sit me down in you know, my teens and speak to me about his stories of life. Not that I elicited this, but I sat and listened. Why? Why? There's a compulsion there, I suppose, to be known. So that's mm -hmm. what I did. I put myself in the position of the father wanting to convey all the truths of his life uh, to his son um, and do it in the most intimate way. And that was a sort of hot seating in a way, but in, in an awful form, I suppose. That's great. What novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, uh, novels. Uh, I recently read um, a wonderful novel called Here Again Now by uh, Okechukwu Nzelu. And that is a beautiful book because I had no idea about how a gay Nigerian uh, culture uh, survives in a world of machismo and a sort of, you know, draconian, very narrow view to Christianity, which says it's an abomination. Um, uh, anybody, you know, LGBTQ plus is an abomination to, to that culture largely not completely, and over, I'm not generalizing, but largely. And to read his story was that wonderful thing where you get taken to another world, a world that you don't know about, you don't inhabit, and to understand it from the inside um, to a degree was, was really wonderful. So that, that struck me as a, a, beautiful, a beautiful read. Um, there's another book I read um, uh, by uh, Alexis uh, Kerr, I believe that's his surname, forgive me. Um, and it was called Windward People. And that one's amazing because that one is really about the island of St. Vincent, which is very next to, right next to St. Lucia. But he takes you through the sort of odyssey through time. So you feel like you're, you're going through a sort of time machine to younger um, versions of the, the author, but also history. That it's not his history, but researched history of other uh, young men who, who, were, who were part of, and women who were part of the St. Vincent um, history, St. Vincentian history. And that is just beautiful. I say it in a very dry way, but it's beautiful and it's funny. And he goes to Aotearoa, I think we have to call that now, New Zealand, um, as, a, as an older man. So it's, it's a mixture of biography and historical fiction too. And it's just beautifully done, beautifully rendered. So those, those books I've really enjoyed. And, um, and any book really that, that I've been reading lately has, has largely been to uh, sort of shore up my my sort of knowledge. So some other books that I've I've been looking at, obviously David Olasunga's Black and British, which is a wonderful big old tome that takes you through a lot of um, Black British history, um, and Hakim Ali's series of books, um, African and Caribbean uh, people in in Britain. I think is his, his latest one, something like that. But Hakim Ali is a great author. To read, so these are non-fiction books, but they they write sure. in entertaining ways that that really help and sort of grab grab you and make you remember history. That's great. And um, what do you have upcoming in terms of on the screen? I think one of those would be Willy Wonka, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the big one. I think I've uh, <laughs> I've got I'm very excited about seeing it, um, and of course you've got the wonderful Timothy Chalamet playing the young Willy Wonka. I, I imagine it, you know, I, know I, I would say that it, if you're going to describe it, I hope they don't mind me saying this, Warner Brothers, but I think it's like a, a prequel to the, the first Gene Wilder Wonka movie, um, and it, it, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, because it, it has a young uh, Willy Wonka coming to town, and uh, I play 
character called Arthur Slugworth, who is one of three. Yeah, there's no other way to describe them. Evil chocolatiers who want to, <laughs> who want to kill him. So I'm imagining that I will be hated by an entire generation of children now. So uh, I should probably do really nice charitable things and make myself very prominent in the, hey, he's a nice cuddly guy before they see this thing in, in, uh, later in the year and, and, I, and I get babies crying when they see me um, instantly. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, again, we've been speaking to Patterson Joseph, award-winning actor and now author of the new novel, The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Patterson, thanks for doing this interview. You're very welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Absolutely. I had, on reflection, little right to survive. Born on a slave ship crossing the Atlantic Ocean on what is quaintly described as the Middle Passage. I now say a slave ship is neither in a passage, nor does it navigate the middle of anywhere. It sails straight to the heart of hell. My future articulacy would have astounded my master, standing a safe distance from the helpless African girl of unknown origin, a daughter of Eve from somewhere along the Guinea coast. Neither would it have occurred as a possibility to my terrified boy father. Traumatized by the last day's events and near paralyzed, emasculated by fear of the unknown. In contrast, his wife, my mother, is simply, luckily, lost in the bewildered agony of a painful breech birth. Lucky to be together at all, these child parents, captured and sold as slaves, I would guess, by a rival tribe's chief. The human spoils of war. Lucky. A charnel house of black flesh, this, cramped and rank with rat droppings and the spillage of a thousand filthy slop buckets. Filth amassed over the fifteen years of this ship's barbaric life. A life spent plying its brutal, unfeeling trade between the pestilential slaughterhouses of the Guinea or Slave Coast and the slow death of plantation life in the Americas which awaited the cursed souls who were doomed to never return home. Neither they nor their offspring. A permanently lost tribe. Let us roam. Leaving the child parents to their agonies for a moment, let us venture to the next deck down. No, not that lower mezzanine deck. That one is for the pickaninnies. They can really pack them in there. Conveniently small, these little ones. They hardly complain at all, but simply lie in stupefied terror. All the better. Much less trouble that way. Quieter. No, we need to look at the lowest deck. We find the men's quarters, quite the largest space in the ship. Roomy. Or at least it would be, if three hundred men were not crammed head to toe so tightly that no room can be afforded for the slightest movement, without feeling the calloused skin of a stranger's feet, or the tangled, woolly roughness of the hair of one's neighbor, pungently ripe with sweat and the acrid smell of fear and death. The rhythmic rolling of the ship, accompanied by the groans of hundreds of men who cannot speak or understand each other's languages. Divide and rule starts early in the seasoning process. That shameless word for the conditioning for a life of slavery that the white and black traders along this treacherous coast give to the slave apprenticeship. An apprenticeship that starts in earnest once the enslaved soul has reached their destination, usually a plantation of one kind or another, cotton, sugar cane, tobacco, crops that bring ready money. Commerce, where will your cruelty end? Let us hurry back up to the birth cabin. Our young mother-to-be is about to bring our main subject forth. Past the mid-deck with the women and young girls' deck, half the area of that of the men, and made more uncomfortable for them by the fact that some are in stages of pregnancy akin to Our Lady above, who, now we see, has expired. There is the dumbstruck master, the surgeon charged with midwifery duties guiltily sullen, the near catatonic gaze of the frightened boy father, now without a soul who knew him free. He has the fleeting notion to bolt from the room, perhaps to fling himself overboard, broken by the loss of his wife, his life's companion. Futile. He will be shackled below with the rest. 
What are the debris left in the wake of this storm of grief? The mewling, puking infant boy, soon baptized Charles Ignatius, after the father of the Jesuits, and growing strong and round, always round, in New Granada. Thank you for listening to this clip provided to you by Macmillan Audio. To hear more, look for this title wherever audiobooks are sold. At Kroger, shopping with pickup and delivery is the same as shopping in-store. Same low prices, deals, and rewards on the same high-quality items. It's one small click for groceries, one big win for busy families everywhere. Start your cart today at Kroger.com. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Choose from a great selection of digital coupons and use them up to five times in one transaction. Check our app for details. Kroger, fresh for everyone.